And the whole purpose of this talk is actually going to be to enable you guys to um, write your own um, transceivers, right? So it's very important that like nobody feels like they're left behind. If there's stuff you want to ask, go ahead. And if we can't finish the whole presentation in time, then so be it. I'd rather have everyone sort of be on the same page as me than sort of uh, you know go go over the slide too fast. So just like very quickly, what about myself? I mean, I already gave the introduction to the whole track. Like, if you find a guy called M Brown online, that's me. Like, so again, if you have the most common name in the universe, you have to sort of fiddle around with the characters. Um, I've been contributing to GNU Radio for for a couple of years now, and um, I did that mainly while I was at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, where I also uh, got my PhD. I've recently graduated and now a full time. A developer for for Edda's research. Congratulations. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I'm I've, I've kind of split this into two parts. And first of all, I'd like to talk about how to build files using OFDM. And the whole point of this part is that you should be able to uh, make files without actually knowing all the details. Like, say you come from the computer science end and you know lots about link layer stuff and Max, like Andre was talking about. And then you sort of just need something to connect your devices over the, over the air. Then, um, like, I'd like to make this process as easy as possible for you guys. Okay. So, and I mean, I don't know if you, this is kind of like one of our favorite uh, comics in the at the lab. Um, there are some some issues, and I hope that I can sort of uh, sort of point out the most important ones today. Okay. Just very quickly, when I'm talking about OFDM, what does that even mean? stands for orthogonal frequency division multiplexing and it's basically it's just a way to get um, <coughs> lots of data over the air so I mean there's there's all kinds of ways we can do that and um, OFDM has kind of become very popular it's used in pretty much every standard nowadays um, and like this is this might get too far into details but I just want to sort of put this in here what we do is we transmit um, data on different frequencies at the same time and so like if you have a look at this picture here you can sort of like this is a time frequency diagram and um, basically like we have complex symbols that represent bits that's, that's the common way how we uh, operate in digital communications and sort of like you can see these complex symbols they're sort of spread out in time and frequency and um, like if, if you don't know what complex symbols are just imagine like have a look at this um, you take bits in this case you take two bits and then you map them onto a complex number. And this picture was copied straight out of the 802.11 standard. So this is um, all very, very real stuff that I'm talking about. Okay? And when I talk about OFDM symbols, I'm talking about symbols transmitted at the same time. When I'm talking about subcarriers, I'm talking about this narrowband transmission of one frequency. When I'm talking about a frame, that's like a, um, like a set of OFDM symbols. And if you, like, this is sort of kind of a textbook representation of an OFDM transmitter. <coughs> so I guess there should be an arrow here that says something like bits. We um, map bits to complex symbols and we have this IFT operation, which for reasons I don't want to explain here, um, you know, do this uh, uh, frequency division, <laughs> multiplexing. Um, between symbols, we, we add a guard time, which we call cyclic prefix, and from here on it's just your standard um, transmitter path. Okay. So the um, question is, how can we like implement all of this in GNU Radio? And like, there's one idea. That, for example, Wi-Fi um, uses OCM, but it doesn't use fixed packet lengths, right? So um, you have like MTUs of MTUs of different sizes, or say you're SSHing over Wi-Fi and you use the push flag a lot. You might be sending out very short packets, and then you download something, you get longer packets. And this is kind of something, like if you have your standard um, flow architecture, then it, kind of, it can be a bit difficult to implement something like this because you don't have states in a GNU radio flow graph and we can't sort of like do if and then wait for this and then do something else. But it's all possible, I'm going to show you how. Um, okay, there's one core feature of GNU radio that's sort of still quite new and I'd like to reiterate on that before I go into the actual presentation, they're called tagged stream blocks. Now like, just like, give me a hands up, like who actually knows sort of what GNU Radio does? Like it's 
Oh, who doesn't? That's more important, actually. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, just like has has actually you know an idea about sort of how the radio program works. Um. So, like, this is kind of what Tom had open earlier. Um, so these rectangles are called blocks, and we put data into a block, and then it gets processed. Something happens, and these arrows represent sort of the connections or the buffers between these blocks. And we can sort of like imagine we have a sound card input, and then we put that into a filter. And you can sort of imagine that like data going through all the time. But when we're handling packets, like this can be a bit awkward. So we introduce this concept of tag stream blocks, and these are blocks that operate really exactly like other blocks, but they understand the concept of a packet boundary. So we have like a, a set number of items that go into this block, and then it, the block knows that this is the first and this is the last item. And imagine um, like a filter, sort of, you can't sort of filter like continuously because you'd have like overlap between um, packets, and this is something we got rid of with this concept. Um, and there's a couple of examples of tag stream blocks that I'm going to show you. Actually, I have a demo right here. So this is, I think I'll just close the block list so we get more space. OK, so this is a um, very, very simple flow graph. It will just generate a signal. It doesn't matter what. And don't bother about this block either. But the idea is like when you're coming out of here, you have an infinite stream. Like It'll just produce data all the time. And this block does the transition where it goes from one um, state to the other. The thing is, like from a um, like from a ten thousand feet point of view, there's not much of a difference. So all of this gets handled in the same way by the GNU radio scheduler. But here we get an idea about how this works. And this is the reason this is true is because we have tags that denote the position. Now I'm creating a sine wave here, but it could be anything else. It could be bits. And what you can see here, like these little triangles, are actually tags that denote the beginning of a packet. So if we zoom into this um, here, like you can just see, like this is the start of a packet, and this is the start of the next packet. In between, we have something. Don't doesn't matter what. And I, I'm actually using the um, like the trigger feature here to to trigger on these tags. So when I'm sort of um, visualizing data, I can actually sort of plot it, sort of, it always starts at the packet boundary. And if you have a look at this output, this sort of gives me, um, it prints a tag, and a tag is a kind of a additional it's metadata that we can sort of attach to a specific item, and you'll see like every, um, I'm not quite sure, like every, uh, well, every, every time there's a, a packet starts, like we'll get one of these outputs. Oh okay, yeah, every 128th item is a, is a packet marker. Okay. So this is just something I really needed to talk about before I get into this. Now, first of all, um, there's kind of two sets of ODM codes. And like what I'm talking about here all depends on the new set of codes, which are like if you have a look at these files, in case you're having a look at this later on the video, um, these, are, these are all that use these new elements. Because we introduced a couple of new features in GNU Radio, which are all used by these blocks. And there's also kind of an old state where we didn't have these features yet. OK? And um, one thing that I always wanted when I was sort of working on this is I wanted it to be truly parameterizable. So I have this like GNU Radio flow graph, and it does OFDM. And I want to be able to give it sort of like a, a configuration that does, for example, Wi Fi then change the configuration, and then it does something else entirely, like um, like DRM or DAB, for example. So this is sort of the idea. And um, there should be like s sensible boundaries between logical processing steps, so you can add your visualization and instrumentation steps anywhere in the flow graph and debug graphically, what Tom talked about earlier. So let's have a look at the transmitter. And the transmitter is available as an example in GNU Radio Companion. Um, oh dear, this is going to be a bit awkward. Okay, so, and you can see that it's comprised of lots of different like steps. So it basically finishes here, but I've got them all listed up <laughs> just in case there's not enough space. Um, 
And it starts off with a CRC block, which is obviously <laughs> not part of the OFDM transmission, but we just need that in case, um, we always need that because we need some way to verify at the receiver that we've been receiving good stuff. And the reason I'm highlighting this is because it's already one of these tagged stream blocks I mentioned earlier. Because, as I said, we want to put in any length of packet, and then what it will do is add four bytes of CRC at the end, and then output a new packet which is four bytes longer than the input. And that's why it needs to understand these uh, boundaries, because otherwise it wouldn't know where to put the CRC itself. And then if we go through um, to the next step, we will actually see this is sort of this is the payload. This is what we want to transmit, and this actually gets split up. And in the top path, we have a block called packet header generator, which um, calculates a header. Now this is config very configurable because if we have a look at it in the um, in the flow graph, like I'm just going to double click this to show you the configuration, you can see there's actually an object which we pass to the block. So the block has a conceptual idea of what it does, but how it's actually done is implemented somewhere else. And um, so there's a thing called a header formatter, and this exists in my flow graph as well, up here. And you can see this is just like a something we, we generate from um, our Python code. So like I'm creating a OFDM packet header generator, give it a, giving it some information about what I want to do. And then if I go back to the flow graph, this takes, on the one side, this object which generates headers. On the other side, it has a look at the payload. And then it calculates a header and out outputs it on, <coughs> on this channel. Obviously, we also need to translate uh, transport the payload itself. I mean, that's kind of obvious. Um, so if data comes in here, then we always have, have 8 bits per byte, which is, uh, this is not going to be suitable later on. You'll see why. So we sort of need to unpack this. And then we have two streams, like this is bits which correspond to the header, bits that correspond to the payload. Yeah, yeah so compressed. And this is sort of the next step. So we have these two channels, and here we um, map the bits to complex symbol. That's what I was mentioning earlier. An interesting thing here is like we can use any kind of uh, modulator on both of these uh, paths. I mean, they can be different ones, and they are actually in this example. So um, this enables us to use different modulations on the header and on the payload. And we could even you know, exchange one of these blocks for something completely fancy and do some, some weird. I mean, OFDM has all of these special um, modulations that affect the signal properties. And we can sort of just change one of these blocks. And that's the nice thing about this architecture is that if there's this one component we want to change, there's no weird dependencies, which means that like blocks and left and right get affected, we can just change one of these blocks. So we've, we have strict boundaries of what happens. After this, we have complex symbols, we don't care what they are, and the next um, processing block will always do the right thing. And the next, in this case, we have a multiplexer which still understands these packet boundaries. And that's also important because, um, as I said, they'll, they'll probably be different length. So this guy has a look at what's coming in and sort of does the right thing at the output. And the actual transmitter, this is actually it. This is all there is. Um, first of all, we have to distribute the complex symbols in the right way in the, in the time frequency plane. And this is also where we add pilot symbols. Now, if you don't know how digital communications over the air work, like we, we're transmitting unknown data. So the, re the receiver's job is to figure out what was transmitted. But we have to sometimes transmit stuff that the receiver already knows it's going to be there to sort of give it a clue what happened over the year. Uh, and then we have an FFT, which is, um, and this is also very nice about the whole thing. The FFT does not care about packet boundaries. And it doesn't have to. Like, it just takes one of the M symbol, does its thing, and then takes the next one. So these tagged stream blocks and the, and the non tagged stream blocks, they interoperate. That's, that's a pretty cool feature. Cyclic prefixer, it just adds the um, guard interval I was talking about earlier. And also roll off. I'm going to talk about that later. Now, um, this is kind of the the problem that we had earlier. I mean, with older versions of the of the M code. Now, this is the time frequency plane, and anything that's white can occupy payload data. Now, as I said before, like we need also need to transmit pilot symbols, and um, they could be anywhere. 
So in Wi-Fi, it kind of looks like this. We have sort of a header, and then we transmit pilot symbols on the same frequency all the time. And then um, digital broadcasting standards, they do something like this, where they sort of distribute the pilot symbols. And sort of this needs to be configurable. And this is an example of where I just change parameters and it'll do the right thing. So um, this, is, this is a Python vector, <coughs> actually a, a tuple. I, I assume you know what I'm talking about. And um, we just denote the position of pilot symbols by indices. And in this case, we only have two subcarriers which transport these pilot symbols, so this is actually enough. In this case, we sort of have to give it a list. And we sort of represent it like this. So in the first um, of the M symbol, we have pilots here and here. Then it's empty, which is why this is empty, and so on and so on. And of course, we can sort of add headers, that kind of stuff. OK. Um, receiver. I don't, the sh receiver is kind of the same in inverse, but it has like one, there was one problem that we sort of were facing. And this is, you know, when we're receiving, we're just getting samples from the antenna. And then eventually there'll be a packet, and we sort of have to figure out how long it is, and uh, maybe even what kind of modulation we're using, and how we do that. Because, um, as I said before, we don't have states in the radio. We can't do like if, whatever, then. And there's this um, block called the header payload demuxer, which solves this problem. So it takes like the signal as an input, and it also takes a trigger signal. Sort of someone else has to figure out when a packet starts. And it sort of, so we get the data, and then eventually we'll get a signal, okay, this is, the pa this is a packet. <coughs> and then this block sort of wakes up. Until then, it'll discard everything. It'll sort of put the whole, um, and then it sort of just takes the header, because that's going to tell us about the rest. Send that to some other processing path, and wait for a result. And when we know, uh, when we know some metadata about the actual payload, then we can sort of send the payload to the next demod state. And this is how we do kind of, it's not really a state machine or something, although there's actually a state machine inside this, but it's just like a, um, like the output of one path will depend on the input of another. Okay, so when we get the header, which is always a fixed length, I mean, anything else wouldn't make sense. And even if you had variable header length, then you could just like take the first part of the header and sort of to figure out the rest and then do the same thing twice. And then you just go the inverse steps of a of a of the M receiver. And I don't want to go into the details because it's pretty much the same as before, except for we have to figure out how the channel modified the transit signal. So equalization estimation. But this guy is interesting. This is a, like eventually we'll get the same bits that we transmitted on the header side. And here we have the header parser. And this is exactly the inverse function to the header generator I explained earlier. And the interesting thing is, if we have a look at this, this actually takes the same object that we had before. So um, this, is my, this is my flow graph. And this was my head, no, sorry, this is the, the header formatter object. It's called header formatter. And this example actually also contains a receive chain, chain, so you can play around with it. And if I have a look at the receiver, I just put the, um, I actually didn't put the header format in here because it's, it defaults to the right values, but I'd be using the same object. And that's, uh, I mean, in practice, you, you're not going to use the same object because the receiver and the transmitter don't run on the same machine, but you have the same configuration. Okay. So like to reiterate, header payload demuxic takes care of this, this pseudo stateful um, problem. So we get the data, we also get a like someone tells us when the packet starts, we evaluate the header, and then we can transmit the payload. Okay, so this is where it all gets interesting, and fingers crossed I hope everything will work fine. Okay, so um <coughs> wait a minute. <laughs> Right. So this is uh, what's the time? Oh, okay, of course, well, fine. So before we have a look at the whole thing, I just want to show um, something about how um, tag streams work while I'm running demos. Anyway, so this is what happens. Like I'm just trans transmitting random data. 
And this little this block will just limit my flow graph. It sort of stops the block. I just I go back from one domain to the other. So I'm just going to packetize a hundred bytes into one packet, but just by definition, and then calculate the CRC. And um, so if I run this, um, okay, I'm sorry about the uh, the formatting, but you can see uh, it's actually pretty small. Okay, so this is the data before we have the CRC, and you can see like every hundredth pack, um, item we get a um, a new packet, and afterwards, like it's every hundred and fourth item because we've added the CRC. Now, if I um, did something like this, or just be, um, I just be streaming data directly into this in the, into this block, I get an error message like this: missing length tag. We get that a lot on the mailing list, which is why I wanted to bring it up here now. Um, so you can pipe tagged streams, aka packets, into blocks that don't understand this concept, but you can't do it the other way around, okay? And it'll just crash and give you this error. Okay, so um, this is the receiver chain, and what I kind of skipped over a bit earlier was this part. So I have this um, upper part of my flow graph, which will actually detect packets. Okay, and the, we just use an algorithm that's called Schmidl and Cox because the way we set up the, um, the the header is suitable for this kind. And I don't want to go into the signal processing details here, but just imagine that this guy will will find the beginning of a packet, and it'll sort of output a high signal on this lane and input it to the trigger. And then we also do some other stuff, um, and but eventually we'll get we'll still get samples that were received from my USRP device and um, pipe them into the same block. And then down here, this is what we what I what I was going on earlier. Like this this will sort of transmit things between two different uh, receiver flow flow graphs or mm. sub flow graphs, I guess you could say. Now, if you have a look at this, this is my um, the part of my flow graph that decodes the header. Like you can see, there's something going on here because suddenly we get these dotted lines, right? And this is because what we ca what we have here is actually a feedback loop, but it's not not exactly a feedback loop which you sort of think of when you like know control engineering. This is asynchronous, like this is just a message, okay? So if you know like uh, if you know what an IIR filter is, it has a feedback loop, and we can't we can't implement these directly in new radio flow graphs. We can put them in blocks, that's fine, it'll all work. But we can't like do real feedback loops. But this is different because this block can wait until it receives the message. Like we can just like do it asynchronously. There's no reason to stay within like strict timing here. Okay? So this is that's what that's how the receiver works. It's like any questions up to here? None? Okay, cool. So I've provided all of these examples in the actual GNU radio tree, like GR digital slash examples. You'll find all of these. And lots of people, they say, OK, it's easy. Like, I'm just going to grab these, start transmitting. Now, I'm sorry? Yeah. I hope, I hope they don't do it this way, though, because <laughs> so, and, and I've gotten about 10 different people asking me the same question, and it's always the same. What they do is like this, and okay, I, I guess the name of this flow graph kind of gives away <laughs> what will happen. <laughs> um, so, first of all, all of the like the OFDM transmitter and receiver they've been packed into hierarchical blocks. And if you start experimenting, use these. Like, don't go ahead and like try and connect all these subcomponents yourself. Like, first get this running, and then you can try experimenting on the rest. <clears throat> so, yeah. So here's the OFDM transmitter. I'm going to transmit whatever. I don't care. Um, in this case, I'm actually resampling. Just, this is just to adapt sampling rates and dump them into my device. Actually, I'd like to um, just go a step back before I run this and uh, tell you about my setup. Um, 
So this is a USA P B B210. Like if you want to ask me details about the specs, I'm happy to do that later. Right now, if you don't know what this is, this is a transceiver board. Um, it's the kind of thing you sort of probably start working on, I guess, if, you, if, you, if you're sort of getting in, into the whole subject. And very popular devices at the moment. Um, I'm not going to unplug it, but this is sort of the antenna to a RTL SDR dongle, which is <coughs> plugged into my USB. You can get them for, um, they're pretty cheap. I don't know, like $20? $20. Okay. So, I. I, I used th this for this example because I wanted to like show you that you don't need ha um, the most expensive stuff to get this all running. Unless you could do it like this. So, first of all, I have the receiver here. I'm going to get it going. Okay, nothing going on because I'm not transmitting. I'm going to start the transmitter. And if it works, then we'll see data coming in here. Well, actually, we're going to see it down here. Okay, I should have tried this before I end, now I have to... Now you have to fix it. I don't, know, I don't have to fix it, I just have to wait. Okay. Transmitters running, receiver, <laughs> receiver sees nothing. Actually, it sees nothing at all. <laughs> that's, that's, that's not good. <laughs> Crap. Uh, wait a minute. <laughs> I shouldn't have I shouldn't have rented out my uh, I shouldn't have given silver in my laptop because I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to <laughs> um, wait a minute where's my receiver here it is is this oh this is actually probably using the no, okay silver can it's you not, can you help finding, me with this yeah it's not finding your RTL you gotta all right yeah but why not All right, there he is. Okay. Oh. Nice. Whew. <laughs> well, I did say it wouldn't work, right? <laughs> so, okay. Start the transmitter. Okay. Something's going on. This is spectrum. But we're not receiving any data. Okay, so. Any ideas? Who's more than data? No. Can you, uh, it's not about the size, man. <laughs> <laughs> average EFFT? Sure. Um, a rapa. Yeah. I'm actually... I'm, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to close this transmitter, a uh, receiver. I'm going to leave the transmitter running and start my... Oh, come on. <laughs> just, sorry. Yeah, I just realized. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm just going to tell you. What I'm, the the um, answer is, like, this is not, this is kind of kind of going the right way. But um, if I'd have started the transmitter after the receiver, you would have seen like a huge increase of noise floor here. And what I did wrong was, well, I mean, I did it, I did it right because I <laughs> wanted to show you what did be wrong is, like I'm, out, I'm, I'm piping the output of this straight into the USRP sync. And the reason this is a problem is, like I'm just gonna restart the transmitter. Um, Rup. Well. You can auto scale. All right, yeah. yeah. Thanks. So, you see these amplitude values? Tom mentioned earlier, <laughs> stay between minus one and one. Okay. I, I'm going way over the top. This is super clip. This is clipping. Like this is not going to work. And this is what most people do wrong. So, okay. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna. You can see here that I'm actually reducing the, the, the amplitude by a lot. And with my... That's much more like it. Okay, so we get a nice LFTM spectrum. Like it's very, I mean, this is really clear. Like this is a super signal to noise ratio. But when you start playing around, like this is what you're aiming for, okay? Um, 
So let's start the receiver again. Okay, I don't I don't think I can run these guys at the same time. Yeah. Okay, so um, here you can see like all these tags. This is actually from the receive side, so I'm actually receiving packets now. And um, like the the payload I was sending was actually a, a RAM signal. So this is just like some bullshit. I mean, sometimes it's useful to transmit a payload that you can plot just to make sure that you're getting the right thing. So this is the actual receiver working fine. Fantastic, okay? So first step, um, make sure you actually get a nice spectrum at the receiver and and you'll be fine so a um, couple of cu couple of hints so OFDM has this problem that we call the, the power t uh, the peak to average power ratio um, which is why we get this clipping thing so with other um, modulations is actually not quite as difficult play around with the gains on both the transceiver side and in, in, in doubt like go back to the gain actually reduce gain on both sides well, this, it'll help you with your linearity there's a feature called roll-off. Um, you can set it in uh, the hierarchical block. Yeah, um, I'm not going to explain what it, what it does, but it helps reduce the out-of-band radiation. Okay, so like if you want to get this perfect rectangular um, shape, then you need to set this to a non-zero value. But if you set it to zero, you, you sh you'll still be able to receive with this kind of setup. Okay, um, so like in WX GUI, aim for something like this. And you don't need these mashes, these massive uh, signal to noise ratios, but what you do need is like the shape, okay? So in this demo that I was just um, demonstrating, I'm using 250 kilohertz of bandwidth, which isn't much. Um, QPSK modulation, if you sort of do the math, it, you get like 350, 375 kilobits. Um, but that's, that's like the maximum value, it's always less than that because like I'm not accounting for headers and if you add forward error correction, which I'm not doing here, um, then it'll still go down. But let's, let's run the whole thing again, just to give you an idea about what's like current work. Um, so this is the receiver transmitter that actually works. There we go, we're receiving something, and now we're just going to have a look at my CPU usage. And I mean, for a low bandwidth um, transmission, this is actually occupying a lot of my cores, okay? So, I mean, obviously I'm running both the transmitter and the receiver, and I also know that um, most of the CPU power is going into the synchronization block, because that has to run all the time. And I'm currently working on a, um, like a hardware ac accelerated um, detector that uses fork that Tom talked about and that's going to help a lot uh, to reduce this okay oh, yeah I'm just gonna leave this where are we Oh, too many windows okay so the big question is like I mean you can use this out of the box as I showed you like just think about the the gain values and stuff and it'll hopefully work um, but if you want to do your own stuff what do you do so as I said, like try and use the blocks as much as you can, because a lot of debugging and thought has gone into these, and like eventually you might have to change one of them or like, add your new add new ones. But when you sort of start playing around, like I recommend going this way. First of all, um, synchronization and detection is very specific to the actual protocol. So what I'm doing here, it it, it could work for Wi-Fi type signals, but then if you have um, digital broadcast signals, for example, it will not. Then you need your own detection and synchronization algorithm um, but you, could, you can have a look at the examples like what's already in there and sort of write something that gives the same output but just uses different DSP algorithms in the background. The header formatter is also like something you'll have to change but we've tried to make that as easy as possible. So um, this is, ah uh, yeah, can you, can you guys read that? No? no. Okay this is, it doesn't really matter. Um, I'll just like <laughs> this is probably a bit easier to read, but I I snipped out the relevant part. So this is the um, 
the base class for a header block. Okay? And what you do is you override this class and add your own info. So basically, these are the, the two most important um, methods you'll have to override, uh, over, overload. The header formatter and the header parser. And like it's really simple setup. You, um, it needs to know the packet length. It needs to, um, it needs an output buffer where it can write the bit. And it'll operate on this uh, vector of tags. And the tags is the metadata. And you sort of write, the, like, write stuff into the tags. But you can also read from the tags if there's um, stuff in there that was used previously. And the parser, as I mentioned before, is in the same method because they, they, they can share code. And it's the same thing, like it has an input buffer which it sort of reads from and then it puts stuff, stuff into these tags. Really straightforward. Like there's not, nothing you need to know about Conradio to do that. You just like override it and then you need to create one of these blocks and throw them into the packet header generator and parser and then you'll have uh, your functionality available. What do you mean? Packet length is the size of the header, it's not the size of the complete screen. So the size of the header is, as I said, fixed. So you, um, so wait a minute, just going to miss my, is my constructor. Yeah, okay, so you can, this is the uh, constructor call, and the header length is actually part of the, of this, and it'll sort of, well, you can't see it here, but it'll be, um, one of the, uh, one of the attributes of this block, okay? And you can, you can query that, and I think you can even change it, uh, no, you can't. But um, but you shouldn't do that in a running uh, while while your flow graph is running anyway. Okay. You you don't look satisfied. Do you have more questions or? Well, the packet packet header here is not the packet that you're gonna send over here, or am I uh, wrong here? So you'll get you'll get this information you'll get information about the payload. Yeah. And then from that you calculate the header. Yeah. Okay and give it back to the flow graph, right? Like, any more questions, just bring them up. Like, it's much easier to discuss it while I've, while I've got this on screen than, than it is later, okay? Oh, okay, so... Right. Okay, so, no, seriously, like, are there more, any more questions about this whole thing? Are you using... Are you using Don't worry. Are we using any others? Iterative. 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 And so the, the, no. You, you were saying Schmidt Cox is taking almost your process there? There's yeah. This is a very fast implementation of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now this implementation like I was just demonstrating is actually um, like if I pull it up in control port you see the problem uh, in the uh, what's it called? Performance monitor. Can it's actually a hierarchical block that um, That's my next question. That, yeah. How much overhead is from the it's, it's, it, most of the, I think a lot of the, the, um, the processing is actually going into, uh, you know, buffers and coordination and uh, yeah. And it's the next question was about the granularity. So if you're going to do this again, I know you benefit from having the small grain blocks mm -hmm. in that you can switch them and you can use different algorithms quite easily. But do you think it's worth it? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Okay. Very much so. Because, um, I mean, you can always, uh, that's the big question of software radios, granularity versus, um, you know, monolithic implementation, yeah? So, but, for example, I'm just going to close these. So, if I have a look at this, this is the whole receiver flow graph. Like, I can add instrumentation blocks at any point, yeah? So, for example, this is my equalizer. Um, and the output of the equalizer should pro give me blocks, uh, complex symbols, that already um, look like my um, like the constellation diagram I'm aiming for. So say I'm not like for some say the the header this is the header parser is giving me faulty data. Then I have all the tools of GNU Radio to to debug this. And like the, the the frame equalizer has the same concept as the packet header generator. Is that the actual DSP algorithm is actually not in the block itself? And you can change the DSP algorithm by passing a different um, uh, objects. Now, this is, it can be difficult to debug this in a standalone thing because like we have all the QA um, infrastructure in GNU Radio, 
So we could just write write a QA C++ file, but that's that's not that's not really easy because you need to you need to create um, test data, and then you have like these huge lists of complex numbers that you're sort of copying pasting into your C file. And it's really annoying, and this is so much easier because you can just like give it noisy data, um, and then see if the output is correct. I mean, I, and like I don't even mind doing this right now, like because I, this is something I'm pretty confident will even work. So. Um, <laughs> Except with the special tag. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. That's I'm actually in the typo in here. We're up to that. So, um, where is it? I'll need a Kuti GUI uh, constellation. So, I can just like drop it in here. Does this do vector lengths? Yeah. Um, Oh, I just do it here. It doesn't matter. <laughs> so, um, right, and I think I need to change this to. Oh, wait a minute. I need to do the WX because I have already have sinks in here. Um, Constellation sink. No, I need a scope sink, right? Yeah. Yeah, you want scope sink. Right, so, and this is like for learning about OFDM and stuff. This is absolutely invaluable because you can like check every single um, point in time, like everything, like this. But in terms of performance, you might have a trade-off. I mean, you have a trade-off, yeah. obviously. Yeah. No, so yeah, it's a general thought on kind of software radios in general. I love the fact that you can do that and put in the instrumentation where you want with the visual interface. But there is an argument that if you were working directly with code, it would be easier. <coughs> so if you if you had a visualization class and you just worked in the code, it might be easier than it's 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 a, it's a trade off. Yeah. I think this is actually, in terms of development time, this is this is pretty good. Sure. Like I mean, as I showed earlier, like it'll it'll um uh like my cores are pretty busy at the moment, right? So um that's that's the big problem. Yeah. Okay. This this is a QPSK. Thing this equalizer actually doesn't output soft states. If you know if you know what I'm talking about, so you get like like this uh, square thing. Um, so this is already the correct output. How so. do you actually extract a single subcarrier? Uh, okay. Um, it's actually not that all subcarriers being serialized. Yeah. Ah, so okay. so you, can't. you can see you can see like the difference of color here and here. Yeah. Like dark blue means I'm operating on vectors, and in this case, one vector is always one of the M symbol. So you get like you get like the time frequency plane. You operate on that. Eventually, you'll need some some block that knows where the actual payload yeah, data is yeah, and sort of right. picks it out. And that's what the serializer does. And if you have a look at the um, configuration, like you get um, get this variable, yeah. And um, you can see it just like gives me a list of carriers. You could, the, the you could misuse this and just put one of them there. Yeah. For example. Yeah. And that's what I like about this this modular approach. Like, say, like you you could do fancy stuff like use different modulations or different subcarriers, and then you can like just make, add two of these. Like at the end of this, like pick out the ones that you. It's just because I made just one to do this. Like, yeah. extract an element of a vector. Right, and that's that's what I like about this modular approach. And also, like very. Um, like what I mentioned earlier, that's, that this sort of enforces like logical boundaries. Like once you leave the, uh, um, where is it? So, sort of once you leave the complex domain and go back to bits, like there's nothing here that cares about where they were beforehand, right? And that's that's really important because you can sort of, yeah, debug different components individually and so on. One more question: Can you actually run the? Um, only if it's actually in there. Wait a minute. I don't. Ah, oh, sorry, I don't have any. Like, I'd have to. Yeah. Uh, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. But it's like you wouldn't see much because it's a huge cloud of millions of blocks doing stuff. Because um, yeah, this is. But you can you can use this uh, this bar this bar plot. Wait, that's the performance model. Yeah, but you still have lots and lots and lots of blocks, and then. Yeah, but maybe it, then there's one peak and you can. Yeah, but it doesn't give you a true reading of your actual, because, like the scheduling overhead is taking over the actual processing overhead because you have so many blocks. Okay, 
So, but if you s and we have no way of accumulating that, that would be interesting if you could sort of like put all the information from one hierarchical block into the uh, like you know combine it in the performance monitor. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think I'm going to too far into specifics. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, um, right. So next question is like, how do we how do we do do max with this? Because like maybe you care about the file layer, but maybe maybe you just want something that actually works, and then you want to implement your own max on top of that. Okay. And um, the the problem is, if you think in terms of files, then this continuous streaming API, this is what you actually want. Like, if you work on files, then you know all about filters and modulators, and then like stuff streaming in and out of blocks is what that, that's your bread and butter. Max are different. Like, you usually operate on PDUs, um, and you sort of handle them packet-wise, one at a time, and you have really like different problems. You have this, like this packet and it needs to be transmitted at this time on this frequency. Don't don't care how. Um, but say you're experimenting with max, like you just need that to work, right? And there's a kind of bit of a dichotomy between these two uh, um, areas. So how do we solve this? Now, what we need here are what we call messages or asynchronous operations in GNOME. So um, you remember like the dotted line in the header payload demultiplexer. This actually already uses this feature for a different reason, but it's actually really de designed to uh, to be able to run your own max. Now this flow graph, um, I have it open here. I close this. Thank you very much. Whoops. So I'm actually. Um, like going between these boundaries, like PDUs streaming back and forth in this flow graph. So um, dotted lines mean PDUs, straight lines mean synchronous samples, okay? So imagine I had something generating packets and then I need to pass them to the file layer and then stuff happens and it gets transceived, uh, transmitted, received, and then we sort of eventually go back to the Mac layer. And we have all these um, sort of message testing blocks in Kino Radio that do all these things. And if I um, run it, then you'll see the following stuff. So I have two um, blocks that generate messages at different intervals. <coughs> so there's one that generates a vector of zeros, and this is sort of output here. And there's another one that just sends the uh, message test, which is like you can see it going up. And they're running at different rates. So imagine. Like the the test thing could be a control signal, like say, okay, like tune to different frequency or power down your transmitter or something like that. And obviously, the uh, vector of zeros would be the data that needs to be transmitted. And this is how we operate asynchronously in Kino Radio. Um, now, what you always need to do to operate on Max is like you need to be able to handle metadata, right? It's like information about your information. And this is, works in both domains. Like we can, like in here, it doesn't matter. Like it's all the same. But we can also <laughs> handle metadata on the file layer. It's possible. And what metadata are there that, that are actually important in Kino Radio? And if we have a look at GIUHD documentation, which is the part of Kino Radio that speaks to my user P, like we know there's a couple of tags that have special meanings. And very interesting are in this case RX time, TX time, because they um, control the actual timing. Okay. So um, the header payload demultiplexer can also understand these tags and any other tags as well. Um, so it seems it's actually not that hard to go ahead and start playing around. So first of all, transceivers, is that a problem? Not at all. Like we can, this would be a valid new radio flow graph. Um, like we have a source and a sync. They may even be the same device. Like we, do, we can do half du duplex with the same antenna. Like this is what happens here. And um, yeah, <laughs> I'm just gonna like this is sort of a flow graph that would have an OFDM transmitter on the one hand, and the one side, and a receiver on the other. So um, no, this is the one I wanted. Sorry. So this is sort of a, a um, like this is sort of a pseudo Mac. It'll it'll produce packets one at a time. And if I start the receiver again, no, 
this is running out of space here. Oh, I think I have. I think my device is being occupied again. <laughs> but um, the point is that I'm transmitting like not non-continuously now, so I can send out packets, and it, the receiver will pick them up. There they are. So okay, so yeah, have a look at this this window down here, and you can see um, it's sort of counting out packets. This is the uh, sequence number. Synchronous, you know, they, they come in like one at a second, and, and in between, both. Well, Receiver transmitter aren't really uh, aren't really working. You're sending some bursts. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So um, this is yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm pretty pretty much done anyway. Um, so this is something I should have. Um, okay, so I can I can also also do that like write an application that does this. So with my, that's right. I'm just gonna start a receiver here, and a transmitter on this side. That's right. So I can just like type stuff in here. Hi, hi, what's up? And so the. And this is sort of what the receiver sees. He gets the, like the message is decoded, but I also get um, metadata about my packet. So I have like packet number zero, nice. That's the first one. I was lucky. Like sometimes they obviously don't get through because of um, bit failures, and then the CRC bond pass and won't see anything. The thing is, if I'm not using a, a RTL SDR dongle, but the USRP for tra uh, for receiver, then I th then I can simply then I'll see the receive time here. And if I want to implement something like a back-off mechanism, CSMA, CA, or something like that, easy peasy. Like it's really simple. Um, so, like the the easiest possible Mac would look like something like this. Okay, I guess you can't read that. Um, so, so this is this is pseudo code. Like this won't actually do anything, but it's still valid Python code. I just I, I just ripped out everything that wouldn't. You know, get my point across. So this is a GNU radio block, and it sort of has these ports where you can like put in the uh, um, asynchronous data, and it'll also come out. So this this is like a block that'll talk to the file layer and to a layer above. So so the layer above would um, call this function, like give it the data, and then um, this Mac will figure out when to transmit the actual time, attach it as metadata to the transmit si signal. And then pass it downwards to the uh, to the file layer, and the same goes on the receive side. So the file layer will know about the input um, port, which sort of operates inside this function, and it will pass it a message. The message contains metadata and the actual trend, uh, receive data. So this this needs to be evaluated somehow, and then we can um, send this to the next to the next layer. Okay. Because I'm running out of time here. But that's fine. Like this is kind of stuff. That, like if you want to know specifics, details, and want to hack around with this, that's what we reserved the last uh, hour for. Um, so what I'm trying to bring up across here is like is that using these um, message ports, implementing these things are really really simple. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So exactly one hour after I started. <laughs> I think it, like, there's time for one more question because it's 40 minutes past. But uh, I'll be around. Like uh, you can, and if, I, if 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 you can't find me here, you can find me on the mailing list or in hash on radio on Freenode. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I don't have any for sale right now. <laughs> but if you want to know about them, just ask. That's what you're talking about. Yeah, the problem is because it's higher. And so kind of a summation of all you have some for sale or on No, not no, I mean you can buy them online. Right? Yeah, but it's a problem with uh, UCS when you order from uh, to get delivered. 
Just quickly, what's the transfer power of the USRP now? Um, so it's spec at um, 20 dBMs, but you have to be careful because you have to know what you're doing because um, yeah, of course there is regulation and there is I know the, the question was mostly so 20 dBMs. Thanks. I'm, yeah, I'm not 100% sure for this device, but yeah, I think but I think it is like it's how expensive are these? Um, <laughs> do you offer any discount to force them attendees? <laughs> Sorry? Do you offer any discounts for first them attendees? No, I'll do that. The regular price is already oh. already has the discount right now. <laughs> <laughs> this one is 900, but there's like a cheap one. This is like my more capable. Well, about the about the. the this is a regular scheme. About the packet detection scheme, have you considered using the cyclic prefix to do correlation to detect the, the beginning of a, of a packet? Well, that's you know, kind of what we do, yeah. You know, because, yeah, okay. But um, there's also a, a, a fixed block in Kinradio that can do correlation. Mm -hmm. oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Who are you actually? Uh, I'm Nico. I'm what about I'm from KIT. Yes. Ah, okay. Yes. 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 No. I also didn't know more about so. <laughs> ah, you. Okay. So I'm just from the mailing list. I'm from Innsbruck. Uh, At the moment, I'm in Innsbruck, but we'll move to Paderborn soon. Ah, okay. Um, and you are. Uh, one of you is currently doing Erasmus in Poland. Uh, no, I'm uh, another KIT guy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting confused. <laughs> yeah, I mean, where did you get the students from? Oh, they're pre-released. So. Uh, yeah. we're, we're testing, stress uh, testing them. It's alpha release. The hoodies. Yes. Okay. I will. Ah, definitely want one of those. It's pretty too. Everyone has better slides than you do. You want some more? Thanks. <laughs> I'm not sure Sorry? Es liegt ja nicht am, am Laptop, sondern an der Kiste da liegen, oder? Ja, warte mal. Ja, uh, you know what the resolution is at the moment? Do you want that Ausgabe mal auf meine? Should be 24768. Yeah. I mean, it's a really shitty resolution. <laughs> But. We discuss this later. Like, I usually like, I don't want to like cut into. Mm, don't know about the resolution, but it should be yeah, yeah, yeah. 10, 24 times 7, 68. <laughs> So, so yeah. 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 Thank you.